middle income countries and in post disaster and post conflict settings as well as on asylum seekers and refugees in Australia. Uh, throughout this work, uh, a focus on human rights is at the core. Uh, with his Indonesian colleagues, he's been working for a number of years specifically on the issue of restraint and confinement of people with, with mental illness. So thank you, Harry. Um, we also have Ben Rinaldo. Rin How do I say your surname? Rinaldo. Is a passionate uh, social justice engaging. Is passionate about social justice, engaging in advocacy and addressing local issues and global challenges. Ben is a peer participation program worker with Mental uh, Illness Fellowship Victoria's Consumer Participation Services and Victoria State Coordinator of Wellways M MI Recovery, uh, a national peer education program. Ben is also producer of the Brainwaves Community Health Awareness Radio Program, which airs weekly on 3CR. He's been a peer mentor with the Personal, Personal Helpers and Mentors Program and holds a, a bachelor's degree in international and community development from La Trobe University and is a returned Australian Youth Ambassador for Development. So thank you, Ben. Um, we also have Fincina Hopgood. Uh, sessional, uh, Fincina is a sessional lecturer in screen studies at the School of Culture and Communication at the University of Melbourne. Fincina teaches human rights on screen, a master's subject which looks at a range of feature and documentary films deal, dealing with human rights. Uh, she served on the juries of the United Nations Association of Australia uh, Media Peace Awards and the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival Awards. Vincina is also a freelance writer on film and for six years uh, she was an editor of the online journal Senses of Cinema. So thank you. And Joseph Swar Swar uh, Swazek. I think that wrong. We practiced. We did, and I was on the night. Has, he'll tell you, you can tell. <laughs> has worked in social policy research and human rights advocacy in a variety of governmental and civil society contexts. Um, he's currently a manager of the research and policy program, the Victorian Foundation for Survivors of Torture, and a member of the board of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. Please give them all a really big hand. <laughs> if you'd like to start off the discussion, or whoever would like to start. Is this turned off? Can you hear me okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic to have you here to see this film and, and hopefully participate in a discussion about it. Um, I, every time I see this film, I find it, I, and I've seen it more than once, um, I find it very moving. It's very confronting, but I also find it very moving. Um, some of the work that we do is working with the Ministry of Health and with others about developing this national program. But it's not until you see the sort of work that people like Nur Hamid is doing that you even begin to understand what the national commitment to eradicate this practice really means and what needs to be done in order to, to actually achieve that. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I think uh, Emmy has done a magnificent job. The, the film is very confronting. Um, it's also, I think it's also very beautiful. Um, she has the advantage that Indonesia is a particularly beautiful place. But, uh, uh, so you know, thank you very much for being here. And I, I hope that we are able to have a discussion about this. Can I say it was an absolute privilege to uh, see this film uh, once prior to this evening and it is a lovely film to watch again because you appreciate the care and the beauty with which it has been put together. Given the harrowing nature of the subject matter, it is still, I think, a very hopeful film, um, which I think is a real testimony to what you've achieved with the film, Aminia. Um, I remember hearing Harry speak about the film at a research forum at Melbourne Uni not long ago and I hadn't had the privilege to see it yet. <coughs> But when you were discussing the movement to eradicate Pasung, I know that um, there was some discussion about concerns about when you know Westerners intervene in other cultures to tell them how to treat their people. And one of the real strengths of the film for me was to show that this is Indonesians looking after themselves and after fellow Indonesians and all of those sorts of 
knee-jerk reactions and concerns that often accompany um, human rights discourse about concerns about Western imperialism are immediately erased when you see this film because it is about, as I say, we are all human beings. And that is the, I think, the beauty and the take-home message of the film. Um, so I really hope more people can see it because I think it has a resonance beyond the immediate situation in Indonesia. We know that this is a practice that goes on in other cultures. But uh, even in those cultures where this isn't a practice, it does, I think, touch at the heart of how we as uh, people treat those who are struggling with their mental health and the sorts of uh, emotions that get aroused between family members, and doctors and patients, etc. So I think there are you know, lessons for all cultures, not specifically those cultures where Pasul is practised. Perhaps I can um, just pick up on that point. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it, and uh, I'm still in a state of a bit of shock because it is, it is very confronting. Um, I decided to do my preparation for this evening not by reading about Indonesia, but by reading about Australia. And I actually read a couple of reports, one produced by the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission earlier this year, and that was, it's called Held Back, and it's about children with disabilities and how we treat them in Victoria and use of restraints and seclusion and isolation uh, are part of our practices uh, and we need to look at them very carefully. The other report that I read was by the Office of the Public Advocate who looks after people with disabilities and mental health issues and it's a report of the community visitors who actually go like these Indonesian uh, heroic people and actually see what is happening. And again, seclusion, restraints, denial of liberty are a part and parcel of what we do as well in situations where we're concerned about people being a danger to themselves or to others. So I think that whole question of what resources do we put in and how do we monitor it is not far away from our society as well. So without taking away at all, I think the the scope of the challenge there is far, far greater than we face. Uh, but let's not look at it as a foreign country and think that we don't have those issues here. I totally agree. As part of my role working in the mental health sector, I'm a peer worker or consumer advocate. And uh, I think the plight of people with mental ill health around the world is uh, very dismal with people being discriminated against and stigmatised and um, I think this film is very hopeful. Uh, there's lessons to be learned from the Indonesian context, not just for Indonesia but for the world, um, both developing countries and the Western world as well. And um, I just really hopeful that we can look to alternative so solutions to mistreatment and human rights violations of mentally ill people. As someone who has a lived experience of mental ill health and recovery, if I had been treated in those ways, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I just want to say that we are very fortunate to have resources and um, access to affordable and effective treatments and psychosocial support both inside and outside of mental health services and um, as my associate here said, um, Joe said, things aren't perfect here in Australia. So. so I think we just over to the to the to you. And in the meantime, Angie is gonna be uh, giving you some feedback form if you are willing to fill it up. And just have some opinions about what you really liked, what you didn't really like, and also if you feel you want to take part in this kind of action. You know, the film is a component, of course, of a number of activities that are happening, and we want to have you also be active in generating and taking part of. So if there is anything you would like to contribute, what would you contribute to the cause of the defense of human rights? 
like air bruises, I guess, mentally healed. So if you want to do it, uh, and just gonna take it around and um, yeah, the form, yeah. yeah so okay, fantastic. Okay. So now it's it to you. And when you when you start asking questions or making comment, if you can really briefly say who you are, it would be interesting to see the kind of audience we have here. Except I'm putting my friends. Thank you. <laughs> I love you. Emmy, thank you so much. I feel completely bowled over by the film. I just think, I hope you win an Academy Award for it. It's just extraordinary and so important. Um, I had a question um, about the ethics of documentary filmmaking and I was curious, I think like, this is so wonderful that you can put this story out, but I was just curious what obstacles you had to get through in terms of consent. Um, yeah. This. Um, well, the, the, the kind of obstacle we're at the, at the kind of start, just try to be going to Indonesia because, in spite of Eris letters and Minister of Health letters to support this project, it took six months to have the visa, which actually included me calling, calling up five in the morning, so many different ministers saying, Where is my application? Why nobody is doing anything? Obviously, there was issues around getting started, but in the end, we managed to get the permissions. In terms of ethics, this is a project that was a part of an ethnographic documentary project, which, as uh, some of you might, might know, is part of a research process. So doing research by using cameras, basically, in few words. So um, the project had to go through the normal kind of ethics uh, procedures, uh, ethics clearance and police check in UK to be checked if you work in mentally. Uh, in people and uh, and uh, so that kind of, in terms of ethics so the process of it there was a constant the classical constant form of plus release forms which I um, had translated in a simple bahasa for people to understand but obviously forms are very pointing for anybody and and I do realize it was a, a bit limited uh, in the films do you see the people you see in this film uh, the family had to give consent um, usually the mother and the father, the carers of the person. In a sad case, I was, as I showed in the film, more able to kind of reinstate the kind of consent. And Asep actually liked to be in front of the camera. But the, the, the way I found that was actually to get consent from the family at least was about, I asked the people I was working with, can you please contact the family before we go there so that you can actually explain them this crazy Italian woman is coming around with cameras, do you want her to come or not? Because I thought, I thought Indonesians are very nice. And once you are there with the camera coming from far away, it can be difficult to say, no, we don't want you. So I wanted to make sure people actually had a chance to say no before I arrived. And to my surprise, people actually didn't, uh, nobody actually rejected my presence. And actually, I had the opposite problem. So families, sisters, brothers, neighbors will come and literally grab me while I was filming and saying, come, come in my village. My brother, my sister, my neighbor, my cousin, he also is chained. She's also in a cage. And people really wanted these stories to come out. I think people are in such a state of despair. And Eric, having worked there for many years, can confirm that families and people are with so much suffering around it and people want an alternative. The, 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 the feeling was actually people wanted this to come out, to be filmed and be shared for some change to happen. And obviously for people who were able to take a consent, they actually took it themselves. Sign. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Louise. I'm a student at Melbourne Uni. Um, thank you so much for this film and for bringing it to all of our attention. It was really amazing and not anywhere near as depressing as I was expecting, so thank you. Um, my, my question was quite a simple one. I was just wondering whether we were just seeing one organisation on the ground, KSJ, um, and how, how many members it has and whether there are any women working there and whether women go out to the communities and whether that might have an impact in a quite religious group of society. This is a process that's been going for a number of years now and one of the um, characteristics is that in every area, in every province, the approach that's taken is quite different. The, the, there is a national program, but for anybody who knows Indonesia, the reach of the national government is not very, very far. And essentially, 
you know, local areas decide that they're going to do something about this or not, and then they set about doing it in their own ways. So they use whatever resources they have, whoever are the people who can be involved in it. I'll give you the example of Ache, where this sort of work started. And virtually everybody who was working on this in Ache was a woman. The key people in that province were community mental health nurses. And they're the ones who did all of the visits to the homes, who spoke to the families, who brought uh, the person into the hospital to be treated and so on. So there, there's a lot of variation in how this is done, and that's true for Indonesia in general about most things. I think this is a particular organisation in one part of uh, Indonesia. Um, it's led by a particular person, Nur Hamid, who's a, a, a man who, um, as it says in the film, has had, had his own difficulties and is, is really quite uh, charismatic. So, and, and I think that's what we're, we're seeing here. This should not be somehow seen as being the way that this is happening all over the country. Uh, but the, the, the kind of the core of it is the same as what's happening over the country all over the country and that is that people are in these circumstances not because the families are cruel, not because they want to keep them chained or locked. It's usually because they care about them and they can't think of what else to do and there is nothing else available. I think one of the things that that is shown um, absolutely, clearly is how difficult some of these circumstances are, you know, how remote some of the places are, how poor some of the villages are, you know, how um, little is known and understood about possible alternatives to what people are doing. So if you were to say, okay, well, what's happening over, over all of Indonesia, one of the things that, that you may be interested to know is that this started in Aceh. But there are now 17 provinces in Indonesia that have an active program. So this is actually kind of really taking off. There are more than four and a half thousand people that have been freed from restraint over the past 18 months or two years. Um, and I think it, it's actually picking up momentum. And um, across Indonesia, most of the work is done by women. And what we're also seeing is a vibrant consumer movement. Um, there's a care and consumer organisation that's been established, the uh, Indonesian Mental Health Association, and there's other uh, essentially peer support groups that, and social activists um, all working towards the cause, many of them volunteers. Um, there's one group that started a Facebook group and um, raising awareness about the issue. And yeah, we really need um, information and communication and understanding. Um. What, what Ben's saying is absolutely right. Um, the guy who was talking about, you know, every person we see says three kilometers is Lily Suwarti. He's a very good friend of ours. He's, a, he's a, a, a young man who has been dealing with schizophrenia for a very long time. He was very involved in the setting up of that, the first association, Consumers and Carers Association. He's been to Melbourne to do some of the training that we do. Uh, we've had contact with him now for many years. And the, the, the other person that, that Ben mentioned who started the Facebook group is Bagus. Now, that group has about three or 4,000 members at least, and there are now local associations in at least five or six, probably more cities right across Indonesia. So the, the, the kind of um, the, the level of activity, sophistication, um, uh, the, 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 the passion that is put into all of this by the consumer and family groups is quite remarkable and it's really only got going over the past four or five years but it's really moving quickly. And it's really exciting just to see the collaborative work from grassroots level right up to the community.
commitment of the um, government from Ministry of Social Affairs and Ministry of Health. So um, I think we need to have a multi-sectoral approach where mental health is everybody's business and um, get everybody on board and on site. My name is April. Um, I'm studying psychology at Monash and it was a pleasure to watch such an inspiring documentary. My, my question is that the cases we all we saw over there, most of them are successful cases where the patients took medication, they were loved and they were released. The, but that also means that there are other cases when the family didn't know how well, how to take the medication properly and how to treat them properly. Um, and uh, they are still changed or mistreated. And the situation might have get escalated, like they have skin condition or comorbidity. Um, uh, and this has to do, uh, I want, I want to know how religion has to do in the treatment because Indonesia, despite of being uh, declaring to be a sec secular co country, the majority are Muslims. And um, through what I know only about Islam is that they are not allowed to believe in witchery or, or um, superstition. But yet in the documentary, they said that they use a spiritual healing or alternative medicine. Um, I would like, is this because the people do not know well about the Quran and interpret the Quran in different way? And how does this affect, how, how does their religious knowledge affect neg both negatively and positively in the way they treat their loved one with uh, schizophrenia? Thank you. Um, well, uh, in, in all the stories that we see in this film and also the others that are filmed, they are not in, in the film, uh, the spiritual or kind of traditional healing um, uh, part of the story was present everywhere. Like all these people had basically at some point sought some kind of traditional healing and that's why they started the movie. You see one of these places because it was an example, but basically all of them had gone in some centers. and. Um, some of them probably also have helped in some ways, but definitely there was uh, issues around human rights abuses happening inside some of these centers. The centers we see at, at the beginning of the film actually was one of the good ones. In the, and it's true, because we actually were allowed to go inside, which is not a, a small thing, because the, the imam there realized that some of his, his uh, um, patients were unable to be helped through his traditional healing. So some of them, got better, but many of them actually did not. And so he realized maybe he needed to partner also with some other kind of treatment, also using more uh, psychiatric kind of interventions. And, but other, is there are other places in Indonesia where um, I'm told that more than 200 people live inside eating centers where there is security guards at the entry and nobody can go inside, including the family. So the situation is like not, not all traditional healers uh, uh, do practices that, that violate human rights, but definitely there is a lot of understanding around mental health. Pretty much at least in the people I met was about healing or spirituality, sorry, spiritual healing, uh, spirituality. So some ways, either a jinn or a demon or some um, uh, ritual as we see in the stories, but the attribution were generally about um, supernatural things, which means people sought help using these same kind of healers. And sometimes that uh, it meant that like, like in, in the case of uh, Narim, the guy in the jungle where he's in a cage, and the mother said actually it was the Dukun to tell me is his fate. And sometimes um, some healers can actually recommend as part of the treatment for people to be chained. So this is some, something that kind of comes up quite strongly inside the film. And it was across all people I met. I'm, I'm very far from being a, a scholar of Islam or a 
of any other religion. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is that Indonesian Islam is a very syncretic, very mixed form of Islam. And it incorporates tradition from Hinduism, from uh, you know, Buddhism, from all sorts of religions. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex kind of Islam. It's only in recent years that the more kind of strict form of Islam is taking hold in Indonesia. And for many other reasons, that's also a bit of a worry. So the, the, um, the presence of healers of all kinds is all pervasive. So the Dukuns, uh, the various other sorts of healers are everywhere. And um, I think one of the things that's very clear is that when people get a better understanding of what's going on, they have absolutely no problem in putting together whatever religious beliefs they have with Western medicine where it's actually effective. So one of the issues is not how, you know, moving people from whatever tradition they have or whatever beliefs they have, but actually giving them a range of possible alternatives that they can think about and make use of for the benefit of people who are really suffering. And I, th I think there are, there, is a, there are lots of examples where people have absolutely no problem in putting things together from a whole range of different traditions, including medical traditions, um, in order to bring about the kind of benefits that they're looking for, for the people after all, whom they love, you know, who are members of their family. One interesting thing about it in the, in the, the group I was following was, um, I don't know if you remember, when we kind of tried to get somewhere at night time and we can't. So we had to follow a person in his house and they say it's a, a tahib, so a, a powerful a medicine man, a traditional medicine man. So the people I was working with, uh, follow, following, they were really trying to kind of link with traditional healers. And some of them are kind of, kind of having a bit of a conversation, which personally we also very bad inside our Western kind of way of approaching mental health, where there is a very kind of separation between Western approaches and traditional approaches. The people I was following at least, they were trying to partner. So which means the traditional healers, they were, they were like, some of them were able to realize when actually they were not able to heal the person, they needed something else. And simply, and also the people who were following more um, Western approach to mental health were also able to know that they needed to have the collaboration because people understanding about mental health was about spirituality. So a very biological approach to it would have not worked because it was two different words. As they say, it's like converting a person from a religion to the other. And that's the thing, it's a good way of putting it. You know, it's, if people have an understanding, you can't just come in and say, no, it's not like that, it's all in your brain. And that's a perspective. So it was interesting at, at all how they actually were trying to work together. Does that also mean that... Um, does that also mean that, that um, natural healers still have a big voice in terms of the treatment and the well-being of the patient? Because you said that um, the healers were colla collaborating with you and leading you the way, but if he wasn't, then you wouldn't be able to, would you? I'm a, a PhD candidate at Monash University in the Faculty of Law and uh, I'm looking at how the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities applies to mental health law and policy around the world. Um, thanks for the film, Aminia. Terrific work. Um, I uh, recently, I'm going to tell a brief story and then I'll ask my question because I'm interested to hear from you all. But I was, uh, as part of my PhD studies at the Mental Disability Advocacy Centre in Budapest in Hungary. And we had a great uh, group of people come from all over the world to the summer school. Advocates, peer advocates, uh, professionals, policy people and so on. And there was someone from Norway, someone from Moldova and someone from Congo sitting in a, in a circle talking about their experiences. A person from uh, Norway said, uh, I was abused in the mental health system. I was locked up and I 
faced coercion and it was found to be a breach of uh, human rights according to the European Court of Human Rights. And that was in sort of, you know, very well developed, expensive services. The person from Moldova said, you have those services, we have backwater uh, castles where people are put into and they're, you know, kept there for years and years. And the person from Congo says, what? We don't even have that. People are tied to trees, you know, and he was a service user himself who had, who had survived. So I think the point I would like to make is that human rights violations uh, occur in, in all kinds of uh, systems throughout the world. Um, indeed, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is looking at the indefinite detention of Aboriginal people with intellectual disabilities in Western Australia and similar practices in mental health services. So. I suppose uh, my question is, you know, how can these movements over there uh, group with movements over here and movements elsewhere, like in India, where there are, there are mixes between traditional healing and, you know, other styles, maybe Western psychiatry. So it's not just a, an option between he traditional healing and Western psychiatry. I think, that, um, thank you for coming by the way. Uh, I think one issue is about linking together, so I'm going to kind of take that one on now. And thinking about, there are people who are starting uh, doing some very, very good work about human rights that are here in, in, in Australia, as in other country. And I think one issue is about really trying to advocate much more for human rights uh, and mental, mental health. I think in some ways we've done some good work, but I think there is a lot to be done to become stronger. There are advocacy groups which are much louder than people in mental health are. And I think one, one way is about really linking with each other is going to be the strength to try to make some kind of changes. So I, I um, I'm looking at this, so this documentary I'm, I'm showing is my main uh, documentary, which by the way I'm still finishing, it will be released next year, so this was a preview screening as you know. But there is uh, another documentary I'm making where I interviewed the different people uh, in different countries who are engaged in human rights um, defenses of mentally ill, and they are in different realities from people working in London where the issues about human rights abuses happen everywhere to people working in, uh, in uh, Somalia and, uh, and uh, in uh, Ghana and uh, in, uh, in Aboriginals in, in uh, Canada. So I think one way, in, uh, I believe, is also about trying to get people together, to kind of be together and supporting each other and getting um, help from each other and becoming louder. I try to really put on the agenda that a mental health is an important part of people's life, of everybody, a mental illness, we know some forms of mental distress are becoming part of daily life for many of us. So putting mental health on more on the agenda and human rights in mental health really up there. Um, just on that idea of a movement that you talked about and how we can kind of um, strengthen these appeals, I think I just want to say that's one of the benefits of a film like Aminia's because I think human rights filmmakers um, have very powerful tools at their disposal to communicate with a very, very broad audience. And this is not to disparage the work of other NGOs and what they do, but I do think that uh, someone with a camera and with a, a beautiful artistic eye such as Aminia can really, really take... Uh, um, that message to a much wider audience in some ways that NGOs or any kind of very dry press release or statement could ever do. Um, and I think it's really interesting that there's this groundswell of movements within filmmaking, such as the Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. There's many film festivals internationally that actually really do focus on human rights. And I think it says a lot about um, people's awareness that there are human rights abuses throughout the world in different cultures, as you say. And that film is a way of actually bridging those cultures in a very interesting and powerful thing. So one thing that you know, resonated for me in terms of that cross-cultural perspective that you talked about in the film was seeing um, the attitudes of family members and community members towards um, the patients and that fear, and that fear of particularly the threat of violence. And I thought that that's something that crosses across all cultures, that fear, that stigmatisation, that stereotyping that all mentally ill people mentally ill people are violent, all mentally ill people are dangerous. We still have that stigma and stereotype in our culture. So I think, um, you know, I mean, filmmakers can play a role in these movements. Um, and I just think that that's why this film is such an exceptional piece of art and policy and provocation for, for all of us. So. 
uh, the human rights framework and the dialogue that's evolving around human rights and health and treatment of people with um, disabilities or mental health issues, I think is a very powerful framework for examining a number of these issues. And I think some of the core principles about consent, what's reasonable in terms of restraints when people are a danger to themselves or, or others, are a, um, a, a point where people from different societies can in fact talk to each other. Because I think the, the core principles are the same, although they may manifest as a very crude form of restraint, as someone you know chained by the ankle with a chain in a, in a, in a very crude environment, uh, yet they would recognise the physical restraints and other restraints that we use here. Um, physical restraints and deprivation of liberty just as much. So I think there is a point of dialogue across cultures to respond to these issues. The other point where I think the, the film is very powerful and it comes back to a point that you made, Harry, and also Ben, was we do tend to look to the state to solve problems. Huh? There's a problem we'll pass a law, we'll you know, use the courts. This showed very much the power of, of a community response. But that's essential perpetually. It's not enough to mobilise the community and then say, let's hand it over to the state. And that was the point that you were making. That continued vigilance of civil society, particularly by people who've had lived experiences, is absolutely critical in order to maintain the, that, as I say, vigilance that things don't fall back into abuse and that resources keep being provided because if things are out of sight, out of mind, the resources will slip and the potential for abuses is always there. And it, it, it's not necessarily malice. It can be just simply, we can't afford this and so we'll use a restraint rather than having two people take someone for a walk. It's as simple as that. The human rights question is a really important one and I think uh, it, it's probably worth, you know, not everybody here is a mental health or a human rights specialist, but it's important to be aware that there is a big fight looming. Um, there, as, as anybody with an interest in human rights knows, there are conflicting rights. And sometimes one is given priority and sometimes another. And the fight which is, which is really sort of building up ahead of steam is between those human rights advocates who look at Article 12 of the Convention on Rights of People with Disability mm. and say this means liberty always under any circumstances and without any impediment, are now uh, in the process of blocking the most progressive mental health legislation in India, which has gone through the parliament but has yet to be uh, uh, approved by the cabinet. So there, there is this kind of contest uh, between the right to liberty and the right to treatment and the right to a decent support and all the rest of it is, is one which is really picking up steam. And the way that this plays out is going to have a very big impact on what we are able to do and what we think is the most appropriate thing to do in the context of people who are suffering from a range of very difficult problems and also those around them like their families who love and care about them who might live in, in circumstances of no resources who have very few options. So I think anybody with an interest in human rights ought to be keeping an eye on what's happening around the, the discussion that's happening now with article, particularly Article 12 of CRPD and the approaches that we take to how we deal with really difficult issues uh, where people are at risk or, or in danger um, as a result of mental health problems. I just wanted to say that um, I think it's really important to put mental health on the agenda and to mainstream mental health across across society as I mentioned before like multi-sectoral approaches so whether that's in um, community development or in humanitarian uh, emergency relief settings for example um, 
where there's natural disasters. I mean, there's a whole range of reasons why people may go on to experience um, trouble or distress, but um, an example in Somalia is where people are traumatised from the conflict and they are being chained or locked up as well because um, people are afraid of them. Um, I saw someone's hand up over here. Is it I have so many things to say, and I'm going to not say all of them, maybe a couple. My name is Daniel Mackler. Uh, I'm from New York. Uh, I was a therapist there for 10 years, and I'm a filmmaker. I'm actually here because you invited me. In the, uh, so I screened a film last night. Um, in some ways, a similar subject, but it plays out totally differently. I, I just, first, just I just wanted to comment for a minute or two. That film was so powerful. I mean, I... I think it was actually probably the most powerful film I've seen in a long time. I was crying, I mean like really crying, and it was, it was disturbing, it was upsetting. Um, and I, I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't agree with everything that was said in the film, and, and yet it doesn't matter because I think it was so powerful. I think I felt very humbled watching it. I think what I, I'm trying to put it in a context of how would I explain what I'm even saying. I think what I realized for me how I define this film was it, it's a harm reduction film. That, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I think like, in a very practical way, it's a film about this extreme form of harm and it's just trying to reduce it somehow. And so I personally don't like the medical model. I, I, don't, I think if at all possible, avoiding medication is good for people. And yet I was thinking, what do I really have to suggest? And since I don't really have anything better to suggest, I don't know that culture. I really don't know, I don't know what kind of resources they have. It doesn't sound like they have a lot. But what I got is, people who were working in, the, in Indonesia that we saw were desperately trying to reduce harm to people. And I think that, even though I'm not into the medical model, I thought what they were doing was taking a step in very much the right direction. And so that's where it's humbling for me, that I don't, I mean, my films are totally taking the medical model and trying to take it in a completely different direction and say, this is, the medical model is horrible, that medication, I mean, I, I know so many people who have been on those, I don't know what, and I was curious what medication they're prescribing, my guess is probably like Haldol or something like that. But it was, because um, I know so many people who call medication, those medications, chemical restraint. So, so that's where it's interesting for me. And yet I know, I, I think of all the people that I've talked to who hated their medication, found it horrible, found it totally disabling to them and a form of restraint. I don't know one of them that would rather be stuck in a cage like that. And it also made me think, who's the biggest mental health provider in my country, the United States? And it's the Los Angeles County J uh, prison system. It really is. And it's like, what do they do? They stick people in cages also, and then they medicate. So it was just like, I, these are the thoughts that are going through my head. I, I, and so overall, what I felt is it's a beautiful film. I hope a lot of people see it. I, I was telling you earlier about this film festival in Boston. It's going to be a mad film festival. There's going to be a lot of people who hate the medical model. Hate it. And I say, that film should be shown there. Let them talk about it. And let them see that, because it, it's very humbling. And so, so I, don't, I don't know if I explained it well, but these are the thoughts that are going through my head. And, and I, I really just think, wow, brave, and I admire you, and it inspired me. I'm like, I gotta do more of this. So, and, and I gotta get out of get out of Western countries and, and get into countries where really totally different things are happening with my camera. So, thank you. Edwinia, did you want to talk about the crowdfunding campaign? I'll pop it up on the screen, and if you wanted to just have a quick chat about uh, what people can do. Thank you for your comment and question, and the share it was actually very interesting. And um, well, it's, it's even, tonight was a kind of a, a night, it was a special night, and I said it before why. Also, because I'm kind of launching in my kind of uh, the website where I'm trying to put together the different projects I've been working on and working on, but in particular, breaking the chain. So if you're interested in this project, you go in the movement.org and you can join the mailing list or just check out what's happening. And there is a big action area where you can see, and I'm building that up. So the film, as I said, will be officially, officially released next year. So I'm preparing my outreach 
campaign and distribution. So if you have some action that you want to propose, I, I'm very happy to put in my take action um, page a possible proposal about what people can actually do, especially if you know of good organizations uh, of any kind that actually are working in human rights. I'd be really appreciate to know about them and maybe post them in the, in the website. And also we are kind of launching the Breaking the Chain post-production and possible campaign. A few of you have already taken part at the start when I did my first campaign to try to get the seed fundings to go to Indonesia and make the film in there. And then now I kind of, I say I'm, I'm kind of finishing. The audio uh, is kind of not quite there. So I need to kind of do some post-production, uh, some audio mixing and then you know, the, the, the post-production stuff to get it ready to go. So I want to launch my campaign. If you can support in some way, if you can support financially, but also just to tell your friends maybe or just try to talk about it. Uh, I'm hoping to reach the goal and be able to finish this film and release it the next year. So if you're interested, if you go impossible.com, you write Breaking the Chains, you'll find my campaign. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. I also want to mention that FinCina is organizing a, a, a symposium next year, which I'm very excited about because being part of the, of the committee, I actually I get the pleasure to see people's submission. And if you can see something about it, because maybe you might be interested to come. Actually, you should be interested to come. <laughs> Thank you, Emmy. You didn't have to do this. Um, I'm very pleased to say that I'm involved in a fantastic project at the University of Melbourne in February next year. Um, it's a two-day symposium that's going to be held at the DAC Centre, which is a wonderful place, a gallery where artworks that are being produced by people with mental health issues um, is regularly showcased. And this special event is called Try Walking In My Shoes. So if you Google that, and if you write, try walking in my shoes, symposium, you'll find us. If you don't put symposium, you'll find Depeche Mode. <laughs> and that's, that's not why I chose the title. I just thought, the reason I chose the, <laughs> the reason I chose that title, Try Walking in My Shoes, is because the symposium is about creating a relationship of empathy between mentally ill characters on screen and the audience. Um, and the symposium is looking at um, feature films and television in particular. Um, and we have a range of fantastic speakers lined up. We are very privileged to include in the symposium a free public screening of the Australian feature film Romulus, My Father, which was based on the memoir written by Raymond Gator. Um, Professor Gator is one of our keynote speakers at the symposium. He'll be talking about the limits of empathy. And we have some other wonderful keynotes lined up. And there will be a panel discussion after Romulus, My Father. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, do Google us and do put the 13th and 14th of February in your diary. Erminia will be a part of the event, uh, together with one of her wonderful colleagues from overseas, talking about the practice of ethnographic documentary filmmaking in relation to mental health. So it's already proved to be a jam-packed program for two days, and we still haven't finished. <laughs> so um, it will be wonderful to see you there. Thanks, Emmy. Thank you. And thank you for that. So we really invite you to come. And also, if you're interested in films, 21 to 23rd of November, uh, Melbourne University at the Asian Institute, CMH, the Asian Institute, are the sponsor of Aperture Festival, which is a festival of ethnography documentary films. Some of them are mental health, but they really go across a number of, of topics. It's a free event, so we are trying to make it accessible to everybody. So if you're interested in, in seeing more documentary from all uh, the Asia Pacific at apertureFestival.com. Also at CMH, at Melbourne University, every fourth Monday, usually, we organize a film night about culture and governmental health. So Daniel was there last night. We had a very interesting discussion about his uh, excellent film. So I invite you to talk to him after, when I'm leaving for Taiwan after this. So, and, uh, and so if you're interested in films, go to cmh.com. Uh, .unimab.com.au and find the same uh, mailing list and you can join us and come to other nights monthly. And thank you to Arts in Action for organizing this. Please come back. Thank you. And before you all go, I'd really like to thank you again for the amazing contribution and the and for sharing all of that with us tonight. Thank you so much for so we do have the laptop. If anyone does want to make a contribution to Cosmo tonight, you can just come and see one of us at the back. We'll just have a chat, have a drink. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you.